as with all of us, I'm in a really unusual situation at the moment. I'm sitting here at home wearing shorts, rather controversially, um, looking out over the wonderful landscape of the Isle of Portland. And that's the image that I show you in the centre of this introductory slide. And one of the key messages I want to pull out from my talk today is that heritage is also home. And we need to consider the home aspect of heritage uh, when we're thinking about uh, conserving heritage. So my talk is going to be divided into three unequal sections. I want to start off by thinking about how we integrate heritage conservation and some of the challenges in terms of the ideas, what I call philosophy, the policy and the practical aspects. Then want to move in section B to introduce you to the heritage of the Isle of Portland and raise some of these issues and challenges. And then very briefly, I want to propose some suggestions for future prospects. So if we think about ideas, as I say, what I've called philosophy, but I'm really talking about ideas. I think what we're trying to do when we integrate conservation of geo, bio and cultural issues is to find a way of fitting together these circles, the beige, the green and the blue, as I've portrayed them here. And what I'm interested in is perhaps that sweet spot in the middle there, that triangle where the three come together. And what I've done in terms of the labelling of these circles is I've just reminded us, as Murray Gray brilliantly introduced in his keynote yesterday, the fact that there is a hierarchy of these concepts. We think about diversity, we think about heritage, and then we think about conservation. And these are all part of the same thing, but it's the conservation which is the practical thing we're trying to address. So what kind of ideas might we use in order to try and make things work at this triangular interface in the middle of these three circles? Well, I'd like to start off by taking us back to the ideas of one of the great Enlightenment thinkers, Alexander von Humboldt, who perhaps lays claim to be the first holistic Earth system scientist, although he, of course, would not have used any of those words. And I've just given this short quote from a relatively recent paper by Anne Buttermer, which just reminds us that Humboldt was famous in those days and is still famous today for trying to have this goal of understanding life unfolding on planet Earth. And that he considered that to involve all these interactions between the organic, the abiotic and people. And many people now are looking back to von Humboldt's ideas and thinking that they're very important for us uh, in the Anthropocene today. The second set of ideas that I want to introduce, which again, other speakers have already referred to in this conference, is this idea of the nature stage framework. So the idea that geodiversity acts as the stage, on which biodiversity plays out is the play that is operating on the stage. And I would also like to argue that humans are very important within this. We're often portrayed as the audience of this play, but I would argue that we're highly interrelated. So I think we can already see we have geodiversity, we have biodiversity, but we also need to have cultural diversity because humans are involved at every stage of this nature stage framework. And the third set of ideas I want to introduce is a set of ideas that my research group have recently come up with. There's nothing hugely novel in these, they're just a different way of addressing a similar problem. But if you look at the image in the top right, that explains who we are. So we are Ox Rubble, that's the Oxford Resilient Buildings and Landscapes Lab. And we're a very interdisciplinary and international group of scientists, social scientists and humanities scholars. And we look at all aspects of how people, culture, geology and biology uh, interact in many different ways. 
And what I want you to notice about this particular image here is that I've replaced the notion of three circles with the notion of three gears. So these then show that there are important interactions between geological processes, biological processes and cultural processes. And it is these interactions that Ox Rubble, my colleagues and I are particularly interested in because we believe that they uh, help us cope with all these environmental changes in the Anthropocene, such as climate change, biodiversity loss, pollution and many other things. And they help lead to resilient and conserved uh, areas of the, of, the, of the world. So these sorts of ideas, the ideas that within a holistic framework, perhaps the kind of vision that von Humboldt had, we need to think about the different layers of the nature stage. And we need, in my opinion, to think about how they interact in a very active way. So let's move on to look briefly at uh, conservation policy, because philosophy and ideas are all very well, but these need to be translated into policy documents which can guide people in their conservation activities. And there have already been many different policies trying to pull together two or in rare cases, three of these spheres, the geo, the bio and the cultural. For example, the World uh, Heritage Organization uh, has tackled the idea of cultural landscapes. very philosophically informed. It's perhaps quite an old and uh, dis uh, very highly debated view of what cultural landscapes are. At a more local level, for example, in Britain, we have many biogeodiversity action plans, local areas that are working from the starting point of a biodiversity action plan and trying to be, bring, bring into that some ideas of geodiversity as well. And also at a larger level, uh, biocultural heritage initiatives have really started to take off in recent years. Policies that try to pull together the bio and the cultural and il illustrate um, how these two need to be brought together uh, for conservation. So the point I'd like to make really here is that there are these attempts at devising this conservation policy. They perhaps need to be better informed by modern day ideas. They need to be critiqued. And then it's important that they feed through into actual conservation practice. So that brings me to the really thorny issues of how do we operationalize these ideas? How do we go from ideas to policy documents to actual on the ground conservation? And here, of course, are where the real challenges uh, emerge. And I've just listed five uh, types of challenge. Uh, just to go through some of these quite quickly, um, if you're trying to conserve an integrated assemblage of bio, geo and cultural, then it's important to think what is the relevant size, nature and connectedness of the area to, con to be conserved. And is it possible to go for the commonly used biodiversity conservation methods of land sparing or do you need to pursue land sharing approaches? Can in reality we conserve equally the three different types of heritage that we're trying to, to conserve. Is that in any way practicable or will one or at most two win out? And from my perspective, what's really important as I'm interested in the gearing between these three different areas of heritage is how can we support or enhance the links between the three aspects of heritage? We're not trying to just conserve them separately, we're acknowledging they're integrated, they function. 
And then finally, a theme that biologists often talk about when thinking about biodiversity conservation is what are we trying to conserve towards? What is the baseline? What is success in terms of conservation? That's really controversial for uh, biologists. And I think it's really controversial when you're trying to deal with uh, multiple conservation goals. So let's me invite you to join me in my sitting room then and look out over the Isle of Portland. From the map, you can see that it's right at the bottom of the English coast uh, towards the southwest. And a very interesting talk uh, about totemic aspects of geoheritage yesterday showed how uh, geoheritage was often portrayed in uh, flags and, and other emblems. And um, I noticed this from the Portland flag, that we have the beige representing the stone, the green representing the uh, life on the island, the blue representing the marine heritage, and the castle representing the cultural heritage. So it's nice to see the iconography of heritage uh, so well expressed in the flag. And I've included the Olympic rings here just to remind you that if any of you have heard um, about um, Portland, uh, we were home for the 2012 Olympic sailing events. But what is the Isle of Portland like? If you look at the um, excerpt from the 1919 Ordnance Survey map, things haven't changed uh, in just over 100 years. It's about four kilometers wide, about seven kilometers long. And it is technically called a tethered island, linked to the mainland by uh, Chesil Beach, which is uh, a tombolo. And there is a very large man enhanced harbour, Portland Harbour, which used to be very important for military reasons. About 12,500 people live on Portland, and it's one of the poorest socioeconomic parts of the south of the UK. It's in the center of the Jurassic Coast World Heritage Site, and that World Heritage Site only includes the coastal fringe. And it has multiple other conservation designations, things that Murray Gray talked about yesterday, uh, SSSIs, and a whole range of listed buildings and structures. And essentially, it is notable for its integrated heritage, but that heritage is rooted in the geodiversity and the geological heritage. So Portland really is the island of stone. And the image on the left looks down from the top of the island, about 150 meters above sea level, over Chesil Beach. The image in the top right shows the highest point on the island sloping down to the south to Portland Bill, which is shown in the image in the bottom right, uh, where there is a famous uh, lighthouse. And you go through a walk through time, a walk through the Jurassic period as you walk uh, across the island of Portland. And you see the rocks which have become characteristic, uh, quarried for the beautiful Portland building stone. But you also observe the history of evolution in some of the fossil uh, and other deposits around the island. Now, Portland is not just a geological wonderland, it is a geomorphological wonderland. It is a very dynamic landscape. The entire coast of Portland is affected commonly by landslips, which have shaped and continue to shape the coast and affect quarrying both positively and negatively. And in fact, some of the most famous quarrying carried out in the early 17th century for Sir Christopher Wren, the architect who built St Paul's Cathedral and other major buildings after the fire of London. Um, that quarrying was carried out on landslides, which had been re re um, reworked material and exposed uh, many areas of Portland stone uh, for subsequent quarrying. But the image in the picture shows an important new landslip, which is just forming in the last couple of years um, and has uh, affected uh, a footpath within that area. So Portland has indeed been shaped by quarrying. So it's not only that the Portland stone underpins site, it has also been removed to form 
the heritage over time, and the heritage is also carved into the stone. But I mentioned a minute ago Sir Christopher Wren, and the image on the left shows some of the blocks which allegedly were left by Sir Christopher Wren. He came and visited the island and felt that the islanders were not giving him some of the best stone, and he marked some of the stone that he wanted shipped out using the kind of cranes that then loaded the stone onto ships, which we see in the image on the right hand side. And he left other blocks behind. But in the middle, you see the face of quarrying today. Um, Albion stone now still quarries, uh, as does Portland stone quarries, but they uh, largely use mining techniques now rather than open cast quarrying activity. But I can't stress this enough that active quarrying is still an important component of home for all of us who live on Portland. But the Portland landscape is also steeped in history. So there is very deep cultural heritage here, which is literally carved out of the geodiversity. So on the left is one of the three castles on Portland. This is Rufus Castle, dating originally to the 11th century. A beautiful, complete ruin now in a very, very dangerous condition and owned and maintained by one of my neighbours, in fact. And on the right, we see Portland Castle, one of Henry VIII's great defensive structures, which is run by English heritage uh, as a tourist attraction. So we have a lot of historical sites, including many other prison buildings, fortifications, harbour buildings, churches and domestic architecture, many of which are listed as having heritage value. But it's very important to note that as with all landscapes with multiple heritage values, they are both conserved and contested. It is really difficult to decide what to conserve and how to conserve it, especially in a situation where there are huge socioeconomic problems and there is not the wealth and perhaps the vision to power major schemes. So Portland has a small and very nice museum, which is run by volunteers. And the image on the right shows one of their outdoor exhibits, a beautiful ammonite fossil from the Portland Jurassic, exposed during quarrying activity, but surrounded by a combination of fossils and elements of the stone built heritage. On the left, we see part of the graveyard of St. George's Church, a wonderful now um, abandoned church, which is looked after by uh, very faithful volunteers. And what I want you to notice in the churchyard here, shown very powerfully in this image, is the coming together of biodiversity and cultural heritage. So growing into and exploding out of this grave uh, is uh, an ant mound um, created by the species Laceus flavus, uh, which is a, a very widespread species. But the ant mounds in this area of Portland are particularly notable and for many biologists of uh, their own interest. We also, for example, have um, a, a broadcraft uh, quarry, which is now conserved largely for butterflies. So that is an abandoned quarry with all sorts of interesting industrial archaeology in it. But the main reason it's conserved is now for biodiversity conservation. So the current status of conservation on Portland, I would say, is small scale, run by volunteers, lots of problems and no clear direction, leadership um, or perhaps a bigger vision. So what I want to just finish off talking about in my section on Portland then is a rather bold plan to try and pull things together uh, a little bit on Portland. Now, I have to stress here that I have no involvement in this project personally. Um, um, and uh, I am, as most people are, quite critical of it. So I don't want you to think that I'm saying this is an answer to Portland's problems. 
I just want to introduce it as the kind of thing that perhaps uh, we should consider and debate and critique. So in Portland comes out of a combination of expertise between the Eden project that's run a very successful uh, biodiversity conservation and tourism destination in Cornwall uh, in an old mine and uh, Jurassica, which is a group that wanted to build uh, if you like, a memorial uh, and a an public engagement centre for the whole Jurassic geological story. And the MEMO project, or Mass Extinction Monitoring Observatory, which is a, was a project um, trying to uh, focus on biodiversity conservation. And these three interests came together, firstly in a bit of a competitive way, and then in a way to bring things together, helped by Albion Stone, which is one of the major quarrying uh, organisations or companies uh, on Portland. And you can read from the blurb that I've taken from their website that they're pretty bold in what they're, what they're wanting to do. They want to have a visitor attraction in an underground mine that takes you through the Jurassic. And this is, again, their, their vision. Um, so a theatre of science, a space in which to explore the importance of biodiversity, the threat of extinction and what it means to be human. Um, and they want it to be located in the Jurassic Coast World Heritage Site where the earth sciences were born and millions of years of life extinction and evolution are written in the stone. And they propose it to be an underground cathedral where the ancient art of stone carving and frontier technologies will breathe life into stories of biodiversity, extinction and evolution. So this is a bold vision here to really try and bring together the different layers of nature's stage, the play and the humans. So to bring together the geodiversity, the biodiversity, and the cultural heritage in a particular point uh, on the planet at a particular time. Now, all I would do just in terms of ending talking about this uh, Eden uh, Portland is that it's been hugely controversial. Generally speaking, Portland uh, residents are fearful of it because it will bring potentially huge amounts of traffic onto the island, it could cause quite a lot of disturbance. There's also a lot of criticism uh, because it's a lot of money to spend on something. And there are, to many people's views, those of us who live on Portland, far more urgent problems to solve. How are we going to make sure that people don't need the food bank on Portland anymore? How are we going to make sure that everybody's properly educated on Portland? And that we don't have some of the health problems that residents of Portland have. So at the moment, I think there are lots of criticisms, but also um, there is some enthusiasm. And of course, in a post-COVID world, um, where is the financial support for this kind of uh, project really going to come? So just to finish off, um, I want to move forward and think about what the prospects might be for this kind of integrated heritage conservation. And there are just four points I want to make. Firstly, that I think in order for it to be successful, the philosophical policy and practical dimensions must be developed in partnership. We can't simply pick a philosophical idea, stick it into a policy and then impose that on people. We have to really work from both ends of the spectrum and meet in the middle in order to have something that makes sense uh, and is doable. I think, and this is a bit controversial, that any integrated heritage conservation plans must have effective geoconservation at the heart because using the nature stage metaphor, there is nothing without the geoheritage uh, and the geodiversity uh, underpinning things. But I also believe that engagement of local people is absolutely vital because places are homes as well as heritage sites. 
And if we're going to land share for this integrated conservation, not spare land somewhere separate, somewhere other, somewhere that isn't home, we really need to understand how those relationships uh, really uh, work. And if this Eden Portland is going to take off, they really need to harness the volunteers that are already working in these micro heritage sites around the island and bring them all together. And they'll only do that if the philosophy is agreed, discussed, critiqued and perhaps uh, altered. And if we're going to have any of these things being truly sustainable, then we must think about being cost effective, flexible and using these schemes to help meet larger societal goals. And that to me seems a very important point for Portland in the future and indeed for many other integrated heritage conservation plans. So thank you very much for listening and for joining me in my sitting room in my shorts looking at the Isle of Portland. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor, for this wonderful talk. Uh, be sure that we have received uh, many questions. So, uh, the first one, the first question is, is from Benjamin. Uh, here it is. Does Portland have geo heritage inventory for the world heritage property and for assisting the protection? Um, Portland is a very important point, uh, part of the Jurassic uh, World, Her Jurassic Coast World Heritage Site. So some parts of, of the Portland geo heritage are, are core parts of the World Heritage Site. I'm thinking particularly of the Quaternary Raised Beach. Um, which is um, uh, at the round uh, near Portland Bill, um, that is, is definitely listed as part of the World Heritage Site. But many people who visit the World Heritage Site actually never come to Portland. They tend to go to Lulworth Cove and some of the major uh, tourist places, uh, Bridport and Lyme Regis. They see the fossils, they see some of the other things, but they don't see the real beauty, in my opinion, of Portland. Okay, so Hen John is asking, uh, when conserving biodiversity, is our diversity of cultural diversity, does the balance between them either help or prevent a good conservation practice? Uh, that's a, a really important point, and I think there is no one answer to that. Uh, my personal opinion is because in most situations I'm aware of, those three layers of the heritage are highly interactive. So in my opinion, it is necessary to try and conserve uh, all of them. But I don't think there have been enough examples of, of uh, schemes like this to see um, whether they are successful on the long term. And again, I would argue that we need to adapt and evolve our uh, ways of assessing what a success looks like anyway. OK, uh, Rosangela uh, is asking, uh, don't you think that the humans, besides being the audience, they play an important uh, role as actors. They they certainly do. And if I could have uh, adapted my my uh, homespun drawing of that, I certainly would have would have added that. Um, I think increasingly that we are both audience and actors, as we have quite a complex relationship with nature. We're part of nature, but we also see ourselves somehow as disruptors. Uh, of nature and above nature. So I think we are an interactive audience, like in one of these kind of virtual reality video games. Um, I think, uh, yes, we are definitely uh, an actor as well. Okay, uh, Paulo is asking, uh, do you think that the other uh, sites, biologists, historians, share the same perspective? And then uh, how can we improve the awareness of the importance of biodiversity in bio and cultural heritage? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, I suspect the answer is uh, no. I think especially uh, 
people involved in biodiversity conservation tend to think about plants and animals uh, on their own. I think the work that uh, Joseph Bailey talked about yesterday with the uh, geodiversity variables, um, and there's a lot now of more consideration of that and all the work that Murray Gray and other people have been have been doing. But I think we have a responsibility as geoscientists to uh, really point out the importance of the geo as underpinning, but also as actively involved in these uh, areas. I think looking at cultural heritage conservation, uh, architects and others are much more attuned to the, uh, the fact that there are geomaterials uh, which uh, you know are, are the building blocks of most sites. So I think they have a better understanding of the importance of the geo. Okay, uh, another question. Uh, you mentioned uh, about environmental changes in the uh, Anthropocene. Does this mean that you limit geo-heritage, geo bio diversity only to this period? Uh, no, not at all. Um, the reason I provocatively mentioned the Anthropocene, it's always very dangerous to mention that when you've got an audience of geoscientists, um, is because that is our current moment in time. Um, but I'm not saying we're only conserving things that are active within the Anthropocene. I'm simply saying that uh, we are conserving them from that perspective of the Anthropocene. Um, but uh, certainly we need to look at everything over very long time periods and very large spatial scales as well. Let's, let's move to another question. It's uh, from uh, Professor Emmanuel Renard. Uh, concerning the integration of cultural diversity and heritage with natural diversity or heritage. Uh, are the challenges the same if we consider tangible heritage, for example, the dimension stones and immaterial cultural heritage? Um, if I understand that, uh, that question correctly, um, Professor Rona is raising a very important point, which is um, the fact that for cultural heritage, we have both tangible and intangible uh, aspects. And that's not really something I've thought through, to be honest. Um, if I could just add something, the opportunity to give this talk uh, arose for me out of the COVID situation. So the organisers approached me and because I was locked down in Portland, um, I thought about these things. They are things that I've thought about in a more general context, but not things that I've ever presented. So this is really, I should have said this at the beginning, this is really a work in progress. So I'm very grateful for these thoughts and comments which are helping me refine some of the ideas. Okay, so uh, many thanks again, uh, Professor, for this wonderful uh, presentation and 